At first glance, 69-year-old great-grandmother Faye Copeland seems a most unlikely criminal. But in November 1990, she takes the stand in a murder trial that shocks the state of Missouri. We didn't think Mom had anything to do with it. Faye Copeland and her 76-year-old husband, Ray, are accused of tricking five homeless drifters into an elaborate cattle rustling scam before murdering them. Well, you won't find no bodies. I think the community kind of found it hard to believe. It's a story of missing people, dark family secrets, and cold-blooded murder. The question the trial must answer, is Faye Copeland a killer or a victim herself? Livingston County, in northwest Missouri. This quiet community is scattered over miles of cattle pastures and farmland. The only city, Chillicothe, has a population of just nine and a half thousand. Uh, it's a small enough community that we all know our neighbors and uh, we all watch after each other, watch after our property and things like that. And I'm sure most people never lock their doors. But in the fall of 1986, something menacing unsettles the people of this peaceful rural area. A deputy from a neighboring county visits Livingston County Deputy Gary Calvert. He's looking for a cattle thief. He was working on a fraudulent check investigation where a Dennis Murphy had written a check for the purchase of some cows. And his information was those cows were taken from the sale barn in a trailer owned by Ray Copeland. Now in his 70s, local resident Ray Copeland has raised five children with his wife, Faye. He considered himself a handyman. He painted barns, buildings. He mowed, sprayed for people. If he wanted to work for you or something, he was fairly friendly. But if he didn't, and he was around him much, and he was kind of a growly old man. Faye was a typical farm wife. Uh, she worked in town in Chillicothe. Gary Calvert and the visiting deputy sheriff drive out to Ray Copeland's farm. They hope he might be able to help them find Dennis Murphy, the drifter accused of writing the bad check. Mr. Copeland's response was that yes, he had helped him haul some cattle. He needed some place to store these cattle for a few days. And then this Dennis Murphy guy took the cows and left, and he didn't know where he was at or any, any more information about him. Gary Calvert thinks nothing more of it, until a deputy from a nearby county comes looking for another drifter named Wayne Warner. He had also bought cattle with a bad check, and again, they'd been hauled away by Ray Copeland. I suggested those deputies get the statements from, these, from Mr. Warner and Mr. Murphy, you know, if, if, they in, if they include that Ray Copeland was involved somehow, let me know and we'll help you with the investigation. The problem is, the sheriffs can't find Murphy or Warner. Since they're known drifters, it's assumed they've simply moved on. The investigation into the cattle scam goes cold. Then, three years later, in August 1989, a call is made to the Nebraska Highway Patrol hotline. The caller claims a farmer from Livingston County, Missouri, forced him to buy cattle with bad checks. But then he makes an extraordinary allegation, that he'd seen human remains on the farmer's land, and he was terrified. The caller is yet another homeless drifter, Jack McCormick, and the farmer he is talking about is Ray Copeland. McCormick tells police he first met Ray Copeland at a church mission in Springfield, Missouri. Ray had told him that he would pay him $50 a day if he would assist him in buying cattle. Copeland also promised him full board and lodging. To the homeless McCormick, it sounded like a way out of his desperate straits, so he accepted. 
First, Copeland took McCormick to the bank and advanced him $200 to open a checking account. Then they went to the livestock market. Copeland told McCormick to bid on the cattle because he was too deaf to hear the auctioneer. McCormick had to pay for the cattle with starter checks from his new bank account. They made their first purchase for $2,000 and hauled away the cattle. But McCormick was worried. He knew there was only $200 in his account and that the check would bounce, leaving him to take the rap. He tells investigators that once back at the Copeland farm, he felt increasingly uneasy and that the farmer's wife, Faye, watched him like a hawk. A few days later, McCormick says he saw what appeared to be human bones near a barn. And if that wasn't enough to scare him, then came an incident that made him fear for his life. Ray had told him there was a raccoon in the barn and he wanted to kill this raccoon and he needed Jack's assistance. So Ray had a 22 rifle in his hand. He went out to the barn. Ray gave him a stick and said, poke this stick in behind this stack of hay here. Try to get that raccoon to come out and I'll shoot him. You sure he's in here? He's in there. I saw him go in there. McCormick sensed something was very wrong. He turned to see Ray Copeland's gun pointing straight at him. Later, Jack McCormick vividly recounted that day in the barn. I never did take my eyes off of it. I'm looking back up at him all the time. I didn't want to run off because I was afraid he would shoot me then, you know, at that point. Petrified, McCormick persuaded Copeland to take him to a nearby town. And there, he made his escape. After hearing Jack McCormick's horrifying story, Gary Calvert revisits the cases of missing drifters Dennis Murphy and Wayne Warner. He checks to see if there's any sign of their activities by examining their bank accounts, driver's licenses, and social security records. But the men seem to have vanished without a trace. With an emerging pattern of bad checks, two missing drifters, and Jack McCormick's statement suggesting foul play, Sheriffs obtain a search warrant for the Copeland farm. On October the 9th, 1989, Faye and Ray Copeland are arrested. Initially, the charges are conspiracy to commit theft, in reference to Murphy and Warner's fraudulent checks. Just before the arrests, Ray and Faye's son, Al Copeland, and his wife sense something strange is going on. The day before they were arrested, uh, they were over at our house, mom and dad both. And uh, mom wanted to say something. Never did, was able to say anything. And the only thing we heard was the, uh, dad telling her to shut up and let's go. I knew something was going on. Deputy Gary Calvert interviews Ray Copeland about the two missing drifters, but he denies any knowledge of their whereabouts. So you didn't have anything to do with their disappearance? I have. Faye Copeland makes the same claim. Faye never really said anything. Uh, the only thing she said was basically, don't believe what you hear for right now. In the meantime, sheriffs search the Copeland's house. They find bank and livestock records and several firearms, but they also find men's clothing, some with name tags that they suspect belonged to transient farmhands. Most of their clothes and stuff, you know, that's all their possessions they have, and they just don't leave them around. If they, if they move on, they take their belongings with them. Most disturbing of all, Sheriffs find a handwritten list of names on a small scrap of notepaper. Next to several names is the word back. Investigators discover these men had been approached by Copeland, but had not gone through with buying cattle. They are found alive and well, 
Other names are marked with an X, and all those men are missing. Now, Gary Calvert suspects the unthinkable, that Ray and Faye Copeland have been killing drifters, and that perhaps this list of names is a record of what they've done. The search for bodies on the Copeland's 40-acre farm begins. In order to make the case that we needed, we would have to have the bodies. Sheriffs also dig into Ray Copeland's past. They learn that he has a long criminal record throughout the Midwest. And his favorite scam was writing bad checks. He had done exactly the same thing many, many years ago in a county over in eastern Missouri. And in that case, they found the individual who had written the bad check. He testified against Ray, and Ray was sent to the penitentiary. Police theorize that prison must have had a profound effect on Ray, and that at some point he decided he would never go back to jail again. That meant he must be very careful not to leave any more witnesses behind. The search for bodies intensifies. We spent several days executing that warrant on the Ray Copeland farm. That drew a lot of attention, as you can imagine. Under a constant media spotlight, sheriffs spend a week scouring the Copeland property, but they find nothing. Roy Cormick told us that there were bones out there, and we didn't find any. Back at the police station, Gary Calvert pushes Ray Copeland harder about the missing men. Well, you won't find no bodies. Is that right? But the worst thing about all this, Mr. Copeland, is I think a few of these people have died as a result. Well, if they have, I didn't have anything to do with it. Then the investigation suffers a devastating blow. Jack McCormick admits he lied about seeing human remains. I told him that uh, falsely to get them to investigate because I was so sure of what had taken place out here. Still, despite the setback, the evidence of bad checks, missing drifters, and the list of names is enough to justify continuing the search. And finally, all the media attention stirs up some credible leads. We get phone calls from people who would say, well, you know, Ray worked for such and shuts. He remodeled his barn or he fixed his fence. I was assigning deputies to follow up on each one of these phone calls. One caller says he knows of a barn Ray Copeland worked on that at one point smelt of dead animals. Deputy Paul Stegmeyer is immediately sent to search the barn. Well, all we was using actually, it was just a steel rod. It goes in the ground fairly hard. If you find a place that's been disturbed and stuff, it goes in a lot easier. Doesn't matter how long ago it was disturbed and covered back up, it's still different from the rest of the ground. In an area that looks like it's been disturbed, the deputies begin to dig. It's not long before they make a grisly discovery. A body wrapped in plastic, buried in a shallow grave, and still wearing his tennis shoes. And right beside it are two more bodies. Through dental records, they're identified as James Harvey, John Freeman, and Paul Cowart. They were all drifters and all marked with an X on the Copeland's list of names. Each of the three men had been killed by a gunshot to the back of the head. We recovered spent bullets from each of the skulls, and all three of them matched with one of the rifles that we took out of Ray's home. On October the 17th, 1989, Ray and Faye Copeland are charged with three counts of first-degree murder. Prosecutors announce they'll be pursuing the death penalty. Meanwhile, the search for bodies continues until sheriffs get a tip from the most unlikely source. Ray finds out that we've found three of these bodies. Ray said, well, I understand you found some bodies and I want to help you guys out. Ray Copeland tells sheriffs he overheard three men in a restaurant talking about how they killed a man and dumped his body down a well on a nearby farm. Say there is a guy in there. Yes, sir. 
Who who's in there? I don't know that. And he's got a concrete block chain around. Deputies are quickly dispatched to the well. So we uh, took a rope with a grappling hook on the end of it, and dropped it down in there and pulled it up a time or two, seeing if we could find anything. And one time when we pulled it up, it had a cowboy boot on it. And the cowboy boot still had what was left of the person's foot in it. So that's when we took the track hoe and the back hoe and dug down the side of it. When the body is recovered, it's identified as one of the missing men who'd prompted the whole investigation, drifter Dennis Murphy. Next, investigators search a barn just 100 feet from the well. This whole barn was completely full of big round bales like you see back in here, so we had to come in here and clear out this whole center aisle. We got down to where the hay's coming out of that one, all the way across that stall right in there, is where we found the fifth body. The body is that of Wayne Warner. Just like the other men, Warner and Murphy had been shot in the back of the head with Ray Copeland's gun. Ray and Faye Copeland are now charged with all five murders. Prosecutors build their case around the theory Ray pulled the trigger and Faye helped organize and cover up his crimes. They decide early on to split the trials. 69-year-old Faye Copeland will be tried first. In the months leading up to her trial, her defense prepares to argue that not only did Faye know nothing of her husband's scams or the alleged murders, she's also a victim of Ray Copeland's brutality. To assess her state of mind, they send her to psychologist Marilyn Hutchinson. She came as a regular therapy client brought by the deputies pretty much weekly for about nine months. She looked extraordinarily beaten down, a very, very sad, sad person. Faye Copeland would say nothing against her husband. But after several sessions and after talking to Faye's children, Marilyn Hutchinson begins to form a picture of a family dominated and controlled by Ray Copeland. He was the complete dictator. Why is And anyone who crossed him or for any reason that he was offended or upset, he would physically lash out at whoever was closest or whoever was on his mind. By the way, I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, I'm getting... They'd met when Ray Copeland was 26 and Faye 19. By then, he'd already served time for forging checks. The two were married after just a few months, but Marilyn Hutchinson learns that Ray soon showed his true colors. Right after they were married, he refused to pay her father for some work that her father had done for him. He stole food from her parents, and he tried to rape her sister. Despite it all, Faye stuck by her husband. She always put him first. That was the nature of her life. Faye's son, Al, also suffered at the hands of his brutal father. He got mad at not being able to hammer a nail into a piece of wood. And I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He beat me with a pair of metal calculators. I mean, that was commonplace for him. The only thing he had to do was stay out of his way. The five Copeland children left home as soon as they were old enough, but Faye stayed. You could see bruises on her, days that we would either, either come over and visit him or whatever. You could see a black eye or where he had hit her on her face or something. Not long before the trial, prosecutors offer Faye Copeland a deal. If she talks, they'll take the death penalty off the table, and she could spend just a few years in jail. But again, she denies knowing anything. We visited her quite a bit, and she would still not say anything to anyone else. Mom was afraid to death of Ray, and there wasn't no, nothing we boys could do anything about it. Based on Faye's therapy sessions with Marilyn Hutchinson, 
the defense will argue that Faye Copeland is a victim of battered woman syndrome, and that even now Ray controls her due to years of physical and emotional abuse. She had been taught for decades to not even ask him a question, let alone criticize him. That's part of what's called learned helplessness. And it's the phenomena that when you've been beaten down so much and so long and so hard, that even if the gate door is left open on the concentration camp, people sometimes didn't run because they just had lost the ability to see an opportunity. On the 1st of November 1990, Faye Copeland goes to trial and pleads not guilty. The defense are confident that with Marilyn Hutchinson's expert testimony on battered woman syndrome, they will be able to argue successfully that Faye Copeland is not accountable for the murders because she was totally controlled by her husband. The verdict will hinge on whether the jury believes it. But then there is a major setback. Because there had been paperwork filed incorrectly and because the attorney general objected, I was not allowed to testify with the defense of battered woman syndrome ruled out, Faye Copeland's attorneys are left with very little to contradict the prosecution's evidence against her. First, prosecutors call Jack McCormick to the stand. He testifies that Faye Copeland handled the books and took care of the transients that stayed at the house. They display the drifter's clothing found hanging in the closet and a quilt Faye had made with some of it. Finally, they presented the scrap of notepaper listing the names of the murdered men, marked with an X. Crucial to the prosecution, handwriting experts established the list was written by Faye Copeland. They say it makes her just as culpable as her husband, Ray. She was Ray's bookkeeper. She had to know something was going on. There's no doubt in my mind Marilyn Hutchinson remains convinced the list does not mean Faye was involved, but she's powerless to say so at the trial. Ray was illiterate and could not write. Ray had told her to write down particular names, and sometimes he told her to put X's by them. True to form, she didn't question why they were X's. Finally, prosecutors show the jury a letter written by Faye to Ray while in jail four days after their arrest. Discussing the search on their farm, Faye wrote, nothing found, nothing gained, and that things will cool down. The prosecution argued that this is one piece of evidence that should eliminate all doubt about Faye Copeland's guilt. Marilyn Hutchinson, on the other hand, believes it's simply a letter from a loyal wife trying to support her husband. She continues to write to him and, and support him and encourage him in the same kind of ways that she had been trained to do so. Um, there was nothing in that note or that letter that was surprising to me. The lay jury listened to what sounded like a cover-up note and took it for that. Without Marilyn Hutchinson's expert testimony on battered woman syndrome, the evidence against Faye is overwhelming. And at no point in the trial does Faye Copeland testify that she was abused by her husband. The jury deliberates for three hours before returning their verdict. Guilty of murder in the first degree. She always said she was innocent, that she didn't know what was going on or didn't have anything to do with it. And the evidence, as far as I'm concerned, showed that she did. Faye Copeland is sentenced to death by lethal injection. On March the 7th, 1991, it's Ray Copeland's turn in court. The trial is almost an exact replica of Faye's, with overwhelming physical evidence. After a 10-day trial, the jury deliberates for just two and a half hours. They find Ray Copeland guilty on all five counts of first-degree murder. He, too, is sentenced to death. But his sentence is never carried out. Two years later, 78-year-old Ray Copeland dies of natural causes while awaiting execution. She loved him from the day they got married to the day he died. It was 
of my love, the love of my life, and my kids. I will always be a love in my heart for it. After her husband's death, Faye Copeland would still say very little, but she does begin to open up about the way he'd treated her. In a 1999 appeal, her death sentence is commuted to life in prison based on undisclosed testimony on battered woman syndrome. Then in 2002, after serving 12 years, Faye Copeland suffers a stroke and is sent to a nursing home. She dies a year later, aged 82. I loved my mom. To this day, I still love her. Did Faye Copeland write the men's names on that list because her husband told her to? Or was she keeping track of their horrific crimes? We'll never know how much she really knew or whether she participated in the murders. And there are three more drifters known to have encountered the Copelands who are still missing. There's still a possibility there's some out, out here somewhere we just don't know. And it'd probably be an accident if anybody ever finds them.